that didn't start just today. This dream for some of you started three years ago. And finally, the celebration of your slip bike run has arrived. What is going on guys? I hope everything is well with you. It's now two weeks after the race today and I would like to go through the whole race with you every single bit, especially the data, my mindset before the race, during the race and especially now after the race and what you can learn from it to analyze your race and get the best out of it for the future. So just before we start, I put for today uh, timestamps in the video, so just below you can see exactly which part of the video you want to see, what you want to skip, because I want to go through a, a few parts. So first of all, I would like to go through the uh, mindset part of it, so really how to analyze the race and uh, all those things. Then the next part will be the race analysis, all the data, everything I did and also a little bit of background what led into that, if it went to plan, if it didn't go to plan what the time was, what the splits was. That's something I was personally always super interested in. So we're gonna get into that. So the third part I would like to go through then, the whole kind of year analysis, just really briefly actually, just subjectively, objectively, did I hit my targets, did I do everything that was in my control, and then we are through the race analysis. The first point today is really just when should you do the analysis, when should you think about your race, I see a lot of people do a lot of thinking, analyzing within even three to five days post a full Ironman and that is just too early. Really just from a hormonal, hormonal side of you, emotional side of you, you're completely messed up. Your body is really through the roof and most likely you will be drawn to all the negative, all the bad things because yeah, I don't know, you're just compromised. You're completely compromised. Even if you think two, three days after, three days mostly the soreness kind of goes away. And you're like, oh, I'm going back, I'm feeling better. No, you're not, you're not good. You're not even remotely good. So if you start analyzing then, you really don't see the full picture. You're missing out on a lot of things. So at least, let's say, seven days afterwards. When you're in that emotional roller coaster, which you will be after an Ironman, totally normal. Just write all the things down, write all the points down, make a little note on your phone or something, because it's important information. If it's positive, negative, jot it all down. First, it's out of your brain, and second, uh, you have it on paper, and then after seven days, like I did as well, I could just look through a lot of things, like, ah, this I can cross out, this I can cross out, irrelevant information, and uh, if you bother your coach or your friends and your family with it, while you're in that emotional roller coaster, they're, they're gonna be also a bit uh, troubled with you, so don't do that. Okay, so let's get into the data together. My full Ironman, everything I did, let's have a look. So just like really briefly, I think it would be good for everybody that doesn't know Ironman Karma or the race course, just super briefly uh, fly through the race course. So you have a swim course here, it's one big loop as a guide. All the yellow buoys will be on your left, so until one and a half K, turn around here, and then all the orange buoys will be always on your right. It's an incredible course, especially here um, in the harbor area. I don't know if you can see the mouse well. In the harbor area there, there's people spectating the area, screaming at you, and it's a really interesting course. Of course, you have a lot of turns and stuff, which is not necessarily the fastest, um, but if you see Alex the Brownie doing a 44 in that, uh, I'm not sure, it might be, might be still very fast. So um, it is a fast course. The whole thing is a fast course. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's the swim course. Then on to the bike course. It's one big loop. You start here in the middle where it says finish and start. Then you first head out to the right here on a big island. It's a big loop. 
it's TT heaven. There can be some wins and crosswinds and stuff, but even there, people spectating everywhere. And actually before in the middle, there's a massive seven kilometer bridge you're gonna go over that connects uh, the, uh, the mainland with the island. Incredibly beautiful. So a big TT loop of around 110K um, before you go back over the big bridge. And then you have a little bit of a slower part, I would say. It's a bit, um, you can't see it so well on the map, but uh, that's a lot of like small roads, left, left, right, twisty turns. And by that point, I mean, hard 20K, you start to really fatigue. So there is also a, a place where you can make a lot of time. And I saw people already uh, dropping off and uh, paying maybe either a too hard swim or like just not pacing well on the, on the loop there on the on the island because even on the on the island loop there are really sections where you're just going like 30 kilometers an hour into a headwind not super many but there are there are. so it's not like you go 40k an hour all the time you still have to work and with a bike it says here 750 meter altitude difference um, my uh, gps actually only had 380 height meters of elevation for the whole 180k so it's it's completely flat basically it's small up and downs but really almost nothing then you have the run course it's a three loop course it's absolutely stunning it's really one of the most impressive with atmosphere i've done it's uh close to there's only three my top three ones are actually uh, kona 10b ironman wales uh, not in that order necessarily uh, 10b ironman wales and here ironman karma really uh, i've done uh, yeah 13, 14 ironman distances now um, but this is really one of the best by far, so um, I highly recommend to put that on your list. Although travel is a bit longer, you fly to Stockholm and then it's still a five hour train ride. So we were actually just coming over from Finland and it was 12 hours travel <laughs> with some gaps in between. So still a long day, but it's absolutely, absolutely worth it. So here we got uh, three run loops. Um, a big part of it is in town. It's like I would kind of divide the one run loop into two sections more or less. One is like really the city part down here, close to the uh, T1 and T2, and there is just incredible loud atmosphere. You don't get a break, you get screamed at and all that, it's, it's, it's cool, but you're also at some point tired and uh, I at least uh, cherish a bit of uh, tranquility. That you also get on this course. So on the north part here, actually you run through the forest and of course there's sometimes music boxes and people, actually quite a bit still, uh, people cheering, partying, and really I've never seen it like that. Like how they partied there and had everywhere those party stations, people just in the backyards put massive speakers out and blasted the music, like really, really good music and uh, people in other costumes dancing. So, so about up, up here still you have like a, quite a bit of just, let's say, uh, you time, me time, where you can just be with yourself uh, and then you go back into town and you know you're gonna get that big blast and you're also gonna run a small path through like a running track, on a running track you run. So overall, it's really a, a really beautiful course. All right, so let's first go into the objective results. So here you have the ranking from the 30, 34 age group. Um, I see a lot of fast guys there, fast course, but still it's, it's and the SAE Ironman especially. Even in the age group ranks after COVID, the level just rose to another world. So you can just be sure that all those guys here that not just sub nine, but there's some of them 830s and stuff, they put in the work, right? It's, it's, it's no hiding there. So they really put in the work and you can just be sure that those guys train a minimum of 20, more like towards 25 with quality and time to recover. So you can just be sure that age groupers nowadays uh, do an extremely high level. I think the level of commitment uh, raises all the time as well so you can be sure that those guys are putting in the work and uh, I don't know what they're working next to it but um, yeah anyways here so let's go into the ranks I got their seventh we go into that later that's objective stuff and um, then here we have the splits so we have a 54 minute split there I was a second in the age group and I think even, uh, I don't know, in the top 10 for sure, even top five of age groupers overall. Then we have the bike split, 4.34. There I came fifth off the bike, I believe, and the runner 3.23. And we go on to all those details later, objective numbers, which ends up to my uh, first sub nine, uh, 8.56. And uh, yeah, let's go into the data. So now we have my training peaks here. Um, the weeks before, you can see I did uh, 23 hours, 23. There's a bit 
I, I think there was moving there, 16 hours less. But then I was around, so I always put quite a bit of work. 23, you see 24. Uh, there was a race there where I got sick with Frankfurt. But that's the past. Let's go towards the race day. There we go. So let's start with the swim first. So as we saw before, 54 something. The first thing that actually jumped to my eyes here, the 3,500 something meters. Uh, I checked with my fiance and other guys, they all had 3,800 meters. Um, yeah, I don't know, garment stuff, I uh, cannot explain that. But let's go into analysis. Um, here you can see the whole beautiful loop. So when you go out in the harbor, actually when I, before I lined up, I was somewhere, let's say with the age groupers in the foyer first, for sure the top 10 uh, that jumped into the water. And then it was just jump in from the pier uh, head first and then start swimming. The pro started in the water, 100 meters shorter or something, and then um, just went from there. So um, here swimming in the watch, I mean, you can't be 100% sure how accurate it is. But at the beginning, the takeout is a little bit higher. As, as the orange one here, you can see also the, the uh, stroke rate. So you're moving the arms a little bit quicker, as you can see, and the stroke rate goes a bit down. But that's the pace, however accurate that might be with a GPS. But in the beginning, as you can see, it's really uh, going a bit faster, 110, 112. I think there was also here a record with this swim. Oh, I'm not sure if it was a record, but um, I believe there was uh, something like 10 minutes, 12 minutes, uh, 115, 116, 117 pace or something or 118 pace. So in the beginning and then here when the pace drops, you can see that those are the turns. Every now and then uh, you always pick it up. My goal was, you can see with the heart rate, it was quite steady, uh, 160, 65, 67. In the end, my goal was for the swim that towards the end when most people fatigue, even, uh, so here have the loop, and uh, in a big corner here at the top, there's 1.5k. A lot of people actually go the first 500 still too hard. And I saw a lot of them, they all, we all went as one bunch, the first 500. It was actually pretty hectic, left and right. Some really good swimmers I saw before, just from the statue and everything, and then they swam well. They swam wrong, they swam to the wrong buoy, took a left turn and took like 10 guys with them. And then I saw, okay, I have to go uh, straight here and uh, then kind of went over them to the right and uh, took my own turn with other guys. And um, then the big turn after, let's say five, six meters, a lot of people went backwards already. They were in the lactate and just got dragged along and then eventually heart rate catches up with you. Um, yeah, so then the big turn on the top after one and a half K, uh, the orange buoys came on my right hand side. My goal was though, after the one and a half K mark to really crank it up a little bit. So after one and a half K, Crank that up, 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 uh, and the last part really again push the pace. Here a few, few faster sections where I pushed it again, um, but I felt super strong, super good in the swim, um, from what I could tell. So, yeah, all done. Should be 125 average for the pace. Then the cycling part here, um, you know the intensity factor a little bit. I don't update my uh, threshold power at the moment. Uh, it's still stuck at 330, but I would say it's around 370 watts right now, 380 maybe even. That's something I never did before. But the stuff I did in training the weeks before were super promising. I did watts and power and torque I never did in my life before. Uh, that is entirely based uh, because of the new training stimulus I got from my coach, Carbon Endurance, John Middlewick. Uh, we finally do the things, especially strength endurance wise, that my body needs to do. And I wish I've done that earlier. Uh, but uh, yeah, anyways, you're learning, you're growing with the sport. So um, let's have a look here at the data of the bike ride. So you can see it's accurate bike course, 181K, if that's correct. Power, uh, normalized power, 259, so 260 watts. Um, Pretty disappointing to me. Um, I think now we can go a little bit into the data or like a little bit background maybe. Um, anyways, uh, two days after the race, I got uh, tested positive with COVID. I had some gut symptoms already before the race, just like not the best uh, digestion and stuff. I thought maybe it's just nerves and had some ear thing, like some blocked ear thing. I don't know, I didn't think much of it, but um, yeah, anyways, I got tested positive uh, more or less right after the race. My wife, like another six days later. And uh, yeah, you can be damn sure that the thing was already in my system. Although, like I said, I felt pretty good in the swim still. And bike, yeah, 
you can be sure that to some extent uh, the body starts shutting down uh, immune system things but uh, uh, one other thing for sure with a bike that's something um, we have to look at here so let's say the first the first hour I was just oh, 45 minutes for sure let's say have a look at this one here calculates here first hour is 245 watts normalized bar I mean you have to put a bit perspective um, first of my heavier guy so for me to 245 to 20 watts is really something I do on my easy rides I'm not even kidding so um, but one major thing is for the bike ride that's something I changed like let's say Five, six years ago, I changed to midfoot shoes on the bike. Uh, it's a great idea basically, but it ruined my activation pattern on the bike in the air position quite a bit. Change to midfoot shoes. What that does, the idea is that you push more in the air position with your glutes, with your hamstrings, which you do because of the different cleat position. But what also happens is really that you deactivate your quads a little bit, which is again the idea because the quads, the front of your leg, you need for running. 100% you can escape that you need the quads but anyways I did it for so long and so extensively that my brain now as soon as I'm in that position let's say 80% of the strength and activation especially if I don't activate the quads with like other strength endurance stuff which I can do after an hour in the water um, it starts using only the, the back of the muscles I uh, took it for the past actually as nerve pain I might have had a little bit of nerve pain going on as well um, but that is not the case anymore, but now it's still, um, yeah, it, it, it feels like pain kind of because it's not the strongest muscle group compared with the quads, but uh, yeah, just the glutes and the hamstrings, they are kind of like really burning in pain uh, for, for a long duration of the bike ride, the first hour for sure, and you can see it in the watts there, for me really not good. Uh, we were looking at something like 300, even 310 watts, what I could do in the planned heart rate range, so between 100, 140 and 150 I had before in training uh, but here you can see there already my heart rate is, is at that low even after coming from the swim which is normally then uh, a bit higher of course and you see in the beginning there's 170 when you come out of transition and running and all but then it slowly comes down to the 150s um, so I actually for this ride only looked at heart rate I didn't see my power at all I only looked at heart rate and um, so I was in the zone for heart rate. There you could see maybe there was maybe some COVID stuff going on because yeah, who knows? I felt okay. Um, I didn't feel like a, like a hero for sure on the bike, not like I did in training, but like I said, I was in my heart rate range. I was focused on my effort. I was focused on racing and not ignoring the feelings a little bit. So um, then what I did in the last, last part, there I cranked it up a bit. There's let's say to 260. There were also sections when I had for 90 minutes to 70 watts. Uh, again, all those things in perspective. For me, objectively, the watts are, um, this whole bike ride objectively in numbers is a big fail. So that's something, like I said, if you analyze the first two, three days, two days afterwards, I was pretty, pretty down for what the whole race basically, because I didn't know that I had COVID yet. Didn't know that the gut issue, which we come to in the run was actually COVID related. Uh, I'm 100% sure of that, I can tell you that later, but um, yeah, so I was pretty down because uh, again, I didn't, I couldn't show what I did in training. Uh, it's, it's a tough one because you have so little chances per year uh, to race, especially Ironmans. The first one I had planned was uh, Ironman Frankfurt. There I got sick actually two days before, that was not COVID for sure, but something in my system that bad that I actually have to stop after 100k on a bike ride, which I never stopped on a bike ride like that. That is uh, an absolute new to me. So that was shocking, that was a downer. <laughs> it took me like a week to get over probably. Um, and yeah, here, I mean, I was happy I finished, I got the medal and all that, but just objectively with the numbers, it is disappointing. At 434, it's cool to see the aerodynamic, the times, I did the whole bike ride on my own, except for a 10 minute section where some age groupers, uh, three, four guys came by. But otherwise I did the whole thing on my own, it was like my private TT paradise, which is a super weird feeling in a, in a massive Ironman. But uh, yeah, so I know aerodynamic is quite good set. And um, yeah, anyways, let's go to the run. Okay, so now we're at the run. This is where the <laughs> shit hits the fan, let's say. And it's not because of classic overbiking or anything. I really kept it controlled. 
And uh, so what actually happened was that after uh, the first 4K, we can have a look at that here, or like a little bit, let's say first 20 minutes. There I have, uh, what is it, 416 average still. So that's actually something I really was confident in that 310, uh, sorry, 410, 415 is something I 100% can do comfortably, even with a lower heart rate. They see my goal was between 150 and 160. So even there, the heart rate is still, still on point. And um, then after like 4K, you can see it probably somewhere here, it starts to happen. After 4K, until the end for the whole 38K, the gut had something yeah, it really started like cramping in a way. I also had to go to the toilet and stuff, but not like a, like a little stomach cramp, but like really bad that I had to lean over. So it, that actually mentally took everything that I had to keep running. Normally when I feel like that, I'm on the couch rolled up uh, with a blanket over me. So especially after the year with, with Frankfurt going south and like it's just so much invested in this race, there was not one second when I thought about quitting or anything, the whole race, not even, Nothing, nothing. I knew I'm gonna get to the finish no matter how. And um, I knew I was, I felt healthy. I thought I had the gut thing. I thought, oh, okay, maybe shit, man, what's going on? Maybe you have to, to concentrate with the GL, something is not well. But then, yeah, it's gut stuff, right? It's not like the end of the world. So like you, you, you keep running, you do what you can. And I had to actually bargain myself doing the run, how to keep going. Because after like say 4K, then I tried, I went away from, from jails because they made me almost uh, yeah, vomit or like maybe made the cramps worse as well. Then I tried, okay, next aid stage, man, you gotta get in uh, three cola cups. Put three cola cups. How does it work for the gut? Which normally cola always works. Horrific. Oh my God, horrific, even way worse. Then I thought I go to solids or like natural food. Come on, half a banana, half a banana always works. Banana in, oh, even worse cramps. So. Yeah, in the end I ran, I think from five or six K onwards, I just ran without any nutrition, but I had salt tablets. Without salt tablets, because we're still up to, th you can like have a look here, 27 degrees. Um, it's still quite warm and humid at the ocean there, so it still felt pretty hot at times. Not hot, hot, uh, cool hot, but it was still not uh, like 20 degrees and fresh. So um, you had to take salt and an arm anyway. So I just took salt and sodium and that was kind of the best that worked. Tried even a bit of Gatorade in the end, which worked in the very end the best, but I had to be careful, like one cup maybe. Anyway, so I was just fighting through the whole end. You can see the pace is going down. Every now and then I had to make stops for toilet. But in order to, so still at 3.22, I saw on Garmin I had 3.20 moving time, which is around uh, 4.45, I think, uh, running time. So that's that's actually the, the positives about that. Of course, when I arrived, I was just so happy. Even the last 2K, I thought, oh, 2K, come on, you know, finish line, try to soak it up. I had really two big ones, uh, big cramps coming that really like lent me over to work. Like, how am I gonna, but yeah. It took a lot. It took mentally everything I have to keep running for 38k with that gut stuff. It didn't stop. It's not like a little little gut thingy. Ten minutes later, you're good. It was something big. So I thought at the time it was um, it was uh, the jails or something like that. You know, it's, it's like okay, you messed it up. You never did an Ironman with that nutrition. So in the end, only in the race itself, you know if it's working or not. But the funny thing is, uh, like I said, I got COVID two days after. Four days after, I had again some gut strong, strong gut issues, and it was identical pain, identical stomach pain I had in the race. There was like rock clear to me, like boom. Oh my god, that was not the jails. There was there was already some weird COVID stuff going on in your gut there. So yeah, anyways, uh, it's what it is. Um, still happy when I think about it that uh, I can run a 3:20 marathon. 445 pace at basically death zone. I'm not kidding. I was just Yeah, so then to be to think even when I was at times I was looking I was like oh, I must be going 530 minute per K for sure But I was looking I was running 430 and that's my kind of shuffle like that pace 430 440 so that is really Really promising that just proves to me to be honest that the 415 or 410 is absolutely no issue on a healthy day. So, but yeah, you gotta do it first. So um, now the chance is over for this year. But um, wait, let's, I think that's it for the data today, actually. 
I don't know if you want to say anything more, you can comment and stuff. Um, but um, yeah, three laps around and around, atmosphere incredible. But let's go away from data to the next point. So the third point now, let's look a little bit subjectively and objectively also for the race. So subjectively, when I was in the race, I just really did the, the best I could. I focused on the moment, I didn't think further ahead. I'm super proud of that. I did the nutrition as good as I could. I did the effort, the pacing as good as I could. And when, when it got tough in that moment, I didn't think, oh why, or like got rattled or anything. I just did the best I could in the moment, rational decisions, and just pushed as much as I could until the finish line. So in that race, I couldn't have done anything better. And I'm incredibly proud of the effort I did, because like I said, that running through that kind of gut pain sickness, running through that and not walking, not quitting, not having one second of doubt um, is something I'm very proud of because if I compare that to muscle pain or system fatigue, it's a joke. So uh, running with sore legs is an absolute joke versus what I did there. So I know that for a fact because I've done hard workouts and also I look forward to doing Ironman with just muscle pain to be honest. So. That's gonna be next year though, because for this year the chances are over. Uh, for me, I could have maybe gone to Kona, because uh, the roll down is there and there's more slots, 75 slots, but I didn't even go there. I also knew before that I wouldn't go to Kona this year uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, first of all, time, money, uh, Kona I think will be a 10k trip, which uh, sucks out my savings, and for 10k, uh, 10,000 10, euros, I can train a lot more full time, it's a lot more worth than uh, a good age group results, even if I would get one, it's not really worth a lot in professional ranks. If I have a good age group result, it doesn't really help me to get sponsors or anything, so um, from what I heard from other guys that had good ones, so you need to have professional results on your resume and then um, yeah, sponsors start to notice you. How do you work your brain through after seeing your results? So for me, for example, it was now objectively, it was a disappointing result in terms of I couldn't really show what I can do. And the swim was okay, like I said, there it was okay, but bike and run, which is the majority of the race, uh, I couldn't show that again. So this whole year, more or less, I didn't feel like I had one race. I had only three races, so you give yourself uh, quite a few chances to, to hit it. But I didn't really feel like in one race that like, hey, this was even a, a great race or like an average race was just like, ugh. So uh, of course I got a second in my age group and summary in there and all that, it's objective stuff. But objective stuff doesn't really motivate me. I wanna see my data my things that I did in training on the pavement and uh, then I'm happy. Whatever rank and result that is in the end, I can't control, same in the pro ranks. Uh, in the beginning, you know, I'm not gonna beat Alistair Brownlee in the first year, so it's gonna be, you have to focus on the subjective stuff. So the only thing you can control and especially moving onwards is your, is your work ethic, the discipline and your attitude. Those are the things that are in your control and you have to keep them in check because if you're too long in this spiral of like, oh, downhill, downhill, even making this video today, two weeks ago, I was a bit dreading making the video because it's like, I have to go back into triathlon mode, into the past, into something already took all the learnings out, but I'm doing it for you, of course. Something David, Gorg David Gorgens talks about, he has a great book as well, you should check that out, is the so-called accountability mirror. I think you really, really have to check into that and have a harsh, harsh look right after the race, right? You, you should be harsh, you should be brutally honest with yourself. Like I said, not right after, but seven days after, look at everything. Really, for a while I was just thinking like, oh my God, your bike speed is absolutely horrific. Like the 260 watts, the only reason you're fast is because you worked your ass off to, to buy a 12,000 euro bike. You, you, you worked your ass off to do aerodynamic testing on the track so you have a good CDA and that's why you're quick, but your watts are still shit and they are the same as you had 2017 but so those are the harsh facts i talk myself right this is just something you have to you say say to yourself or with a gut like hey you didn't train this enough although i did train uh, the race nutrition but maybe not enough or maybe not with a concentrate but yeah just like be really harsh be really direct with that accountability mirror but then super important write it down and snap out of it
people stay in that zone, the self-pity down zone, that's not gonna help anybody. That's not gonna help you, that's gonna drag you down, that's not gonna help your future training, not your recovery, nothing. So get all the knowledge you have out of it, be honest with yourself, but then step out of it, get back to work, have a good work ethic, have discipline. It's discipline as well to snap out of it and not have this self-pity party nobody wants to hear about and is not, not productive and anything. So it's triathlon, it's a sport, we all love it, but there's a lot of worse things going on in the world than having a bad race. So you gotta get it together a little bit as well, no matter how bad the race went. So there are more chances and Ironman is an enduring sport and not just endurance during the event and your training you also have to endure with your mind so you have to make sure that you're enduring constant training 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 day in day out that's something that will make you strong but you also have to endure the boredom of the sport and you have to endure it's a sport right you have to endure the low patches and for me now i had the whole year and my objective my in a low patch am i feeling sorry for myself no do i have doubts that are about my existence as an athlete absolutely no I'm really looking forward to actually going buckling down now after I got through this COVID and really slow conservative build up. I'm just looking forward to getting back to work, having really great training, a hard, hard, hard winter with a bit of fear to be honest for my first pro race because I don't want to be just a number. I want to really as good as I can have the strongest subjective numbers that I possibly can on my own, the fitness. I don't want to be dragged along. That's something I look forward to showing you the group riding, how that affects the watts, I really will be completely transparent in the future. I'm just really looking forward to that. Like really no hiding, because some people are riding 200 watts in a pack. I want to show you that if there is moments when I'm riding in a pack, <clears throat> I want to show you what that does to the watts. Like, it's interesting. I want to show that transparent, but I train my ass off that I'm not going to be in the pack. I don't know if that's next year already, but I want to be strong enough, especially in the bike. That's my strength. If you're a strong muscular guy, like, like I am, <clears throat> that's my strength. You can convert all that muscle into power and torque on the bike and that has to be my strength. I have to become an absolute nightmare on the bike. That's just a fact, so. Yeah, but uh, you can't have any weaknesses either. Swim, bike, run has to be excellent. You can't just say, oh, I'm gonna swim at 54 and everybody's up the road. You have to be a strong swimmer. Next year, I have to be swimming under 50 minutes for sure. I have to ride, oh, I can't process that yet, but 320 watts maybe, 310, it's hard to say, but for sure strong numbers and run really well off it under 250. So those are just things you gotta do. But um, yeah, next to all that harshness with the accountability mirror, you need to make sure then that you are again grateful for your body, everything you have and uh, get back to work, get back after it. And I see you in next week videos. Ciao. I hope you enjoyed the video. You can really help me out if you like and subscribe, push your notification bell, comment below what you want to see next and I see you in the next video.